for all of your forwarding and freight shipping needs. We at Trend Forwarding International are committed to product delivery. At Trend Forwarding, we have the much needed experience, professionalism, and due diligence in freight forwarding, shipping, and cargoes. We deliver with timeliness and precision. You can reach out to us at our Caribbean office in Trinidad and Tobago, telephone number 868 624 6250 or our Florida USA office at 305 887 9725. country like the United States of America. I'm originally from Trinidad, the Caribbean. I know Maulana Abdullah said Trinidad. I don't know how many people know the island of Trinidad, but we are from the Caribbean. We are from the West Indies, South America, whatever you want to call it. You know, I was born there, but I've been living, Alhamdulillah, for the past 30 years in the United States of America, doing Dawa, interfaith, etc. So one of the most unique, when uh, Maulana Abdullah asked me what are you going to talk about, I said, you know what, let's keep this thing very straight, Quran. You stick to Quran, you have no problem. If you look at the barakat of the Quran, things are very straight. Whenever you have disunity, and you have major differences or divisions, it doesn't really come from the Quran. Think about it. And then we look at the basic ikhtilaf and controversies. Generally, it doesn't come from the Quran. It comes from other interpretations. And I don't want to get into that. So that's why I told Allah that we'll stick to the message of the Quran. Mashallah. Inshallah. I know most everyone, you read Quran, South Africa is a blessed place, so many Darul rooms, so many massages, so many madrasas, so many Islamic institutions. I mean, you guys know it here, alhamdulillah. So I'm not here to really teach you anything. I'm not here to even lecture to you. I don't even like to use the word bayan. I'm not saying you should not use the word bayan, because bayan, bayan is ready to make things clear. And who am I to make things clear? You guys already got everything clear. You have studied the books, you are scholars, you are, uh, you know, deep Islamic leaders, imams. So I like to use the word reminder. Right? And that is within the Quranic line. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter 51, verse 55, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الْذِكْرَ 
tanfaul mu'minin. Remind and by reminding the believers beneath. Someone like Shem to you. And I'm not here to clear up anything to you. You got your sheeps, you got your imams, your maulanas, who will make matters clear, Islamic laws clear, and explain to you. I'm only here to remind myself and remind you of the Quran. And we can never ever stop reminding ourselves of the Quran. Think about it. Every Friday, Friday you got a Jummah Khutbah. And as I was saying today in the Jummah Khutbah at Masjid Salihin, the verse on Jummah, Fas'aw ila dhikrillah, hasten to the remembrance of Allah. Allah uses that word of reminder here again. Ila nubiya salati min yawm al Jummah, Fas'aw ila dhikrillah, hasten to the remembrance of Allah. Could we ever say that I have been listening to the reminders for 40 years now? I've been to Khutbah for 40 years, I don't need to go for Jummah. Could we say that? That's not permissible. So we can never stop listening to reminders. Islam has been designed with the most powerful Salah. We all know that. Jummah Salah. More powerful than Eagle Fit, Eagle Akha, or Daily Salah is there. Like the head of all Salah. And that salah is combined with a reminder every week. Every week. So this deen has been designed with a reminder. Whether you have memorized the Quran, whether you have recited the Quran 40 times or 100 times, you still got to go to the khutbah and be reminded. Because we are human beings. We are inside. We have that that weakness of forgetfulness. We have that weakness of forgetfulness. So we tend to forget sometimes. And Allah has designed this Islam in such a way that we always remind Him. Whether we read the Quran and we remind ourselves, or whether we go to the khutbah and we are reminded. <clears throat> so a reminder is something very Quranic. So I, I want to remind myself first and remind you and all our listeners, wherever, that we all know that the Quran, we have been ordered to learn to read, recite the Quran. So I don't think, I don't think we have a problem with that. So Africa leaders in the world with that. Teaching the Quran. Every masajid generally got a madrasa where you learn to read the Quran. So we're okay with that. So we don't need to talk about that. You know, so Africa is so blessed that I was talking to uh, Mufti Saul, I think, and he was telling me, you guys got 300 students in the Masjid Salih. SubhanAllah, look at that. You only establish a masjid, you establish a madrasa, and you got hundreds of students that will come. Do you know in America? Huh. We gotta beg the students to come. You gotta beg the parents to send the students to come. Illa mashallah, you got the exception. There are those who come, though that's my point. But with the majority that you have, it's not the majority that come, it's the minority. So you are blessed that you don't have to really do much da'wah to invite people to send their children to learn to recite the Quran. MashaAllah, you are past that stage. Then we have another aspect. We learn to read the Quran. Then after learning to read the Quran, we got to read it. You can't learn to read the Quran and then don't read Yasin every day. And then don't read Surah Waqiyah every day. And then don't read Surah Sajda and Surah Mulk every day. Because we were taught by the Prophet وسلم, of the barakah, the blessings of reading Surah Yasin every morning. The fadail and the virtue, reading Surah Waqiyah every evening. Reading Surah, surah Sajda, Surah Mulk that makes shafa'at for us, intercession for us in the grave. Reading Surah Kaf every Friday. So one is to learn to read it. And one is to read it. So that's another aspect. Then we have a third aspect. 
in connection to the Quran. Fattabi'uhu. Wa hada kitab anzalnahu mubarakun fattabi'uhu. That Allah commands us now. You recite, you learn to read it. You read it daily. Now you have to follow. Now we have to obey what Allah says in the Quran. And this is where the complication starts. Yeah. Here's where the complication starts. We've obeyed some of the things and then we don't obey most of the things. Think about it. So that's one. The fourth connection. We learn to read. We're supposed to read daily. We're supposed to follow what we read. And then fourthly, the fourth thing is we supposed to spread the message of what we have learned from the Quran. And that's what we, that's the second the second problem. How many of us read the Quran and then teach it to others? Yes, we teach. We learn to recite the Quran and then we teach it. But how many of us teach? The lifestyle of the Quran. <coughs> Basically, generally, and I'm speaking of in the world, world, not here, generally, throughout the world. Whether you go to Arabia, you go to Pakistan, you go to Bangladesh, you go to Indonesia, you go to Indonesia, you know, the world, Malaysia, Malaysia, wherever you talk about it. I've been doing that all over South Korea. I went to an interfaith conference. I was invited. Uh, 30 to 40,000 people. South Korea, that was in 2017, I think. Massive interview. Alhamdulillah, we're invited as a guest in, in Israel. With, and do you know who invited me? Jews and Christians. I was their guest and they paid my ticket. They paid my ticket to do a peace mission. And we marched the streets, rabbis. I was the only Muslim sheikh with that. Christians, we march the streets into the Jewish territory, the Masjid al Aqsa, the Christian territory. We all went together, subhanAllah. I was preaching peace, salam, shalom. That was a big test and a big trial. But it was a, I went basically not to teach people, but to learn. To learn, that's the whole lesson, to learn. So, alhamdulillah, back to the point of the fourth point. So one thing is to learn to recite the Quran and teach it. And that we all know. But do we really teach the lifestyle of the Quran? That's a very deep thing. Many times, if you look generally, and I'm saying generally, I'm not saying uh, everybody, there are the exceptions. Please don't miss my point, there are the exceptions. That's why we have to remind ourselves. And that's why Allah says to be mine. Many times, if you look at the lifestyle of many people in the world, Muslims, yes, we take from the Quran to praise Allah five times a day. We take from the Quran to give our zakat. I really don't know if we give the two and a half percent. A lot of people give how much they want to give. They really don't give how much Allah says to give. See, you know, it's interesting, eh? How a lot of times, like I always tell the people this in America, I say when it comes to, to your taxes, you guys pay taxes yet? Okay, I don't know, you know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, I had a, a friend that works with IRS. You know, what is, what, what, do you, what is your IRS here? IRS? S S you call it? S-A-R-S. S-A-R-S. Okay. So, we are IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. So I had a friend, very high in the um, high in the in the government, with the, who 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 do auditing for the government. He audits people and businesses. He says, "Sheikh, what has happened to your people?" I said, "What?" He said, "These people got millions, but it's under their bed." They don't declare it. 
I'm like, oh, you can't talk to me about that. And I said, wow, this is tough in government. Uh, it was a Jewish guy, you know, we were friends in the interfaith um, activities. So, yeah, from the Quran, we take salah, we give our zakat, mashallah, when it comes to Ramadan, we are fasting 30 days, 29 days. When it comes to Hajj, we go to Hajj, we go to Hajj 10 times. But if we ponder over this, we will see that these are the pillars of Islam. Yeah? Very important, basic pillars. Nobody says no, that is major important. But if you look at a building, you look at a building, well, this is a flat building. If you look at a tall building, you have pillars. But even this flat building, you have foundation. And the foundation is like the pillars. Right? If you don't have a strong foundation and a strong wind come, the building is going to be blown away. So the pillars in Islam, that is basic. The Prophet ﷺ tells us if one of the pillars we don't practice, it's like a house that will be lame and lean. Alright, I'm heading to a point here. So mashallah will take this from the Quran. But we miss a point. That the Prophet ﷺ says that Iman is like a house. Right? Uh, as I said, I'm reminding myself and I'm reminding you. That's why I call it a reminder. So you know this already. I'm only reminding myself and reminding you. Iman is like a house, says the Prophet ﷺ. With four pillars. Salah, Zakat, Fasting, Hajj. Nice. One of the, there is no pillar, then the house will be leaning. So you got to keep the pillar strong. So we all pray on Salah, we give our Zakat, we fast and we perform Hajj. But apparently sometimes we forget the house. You understand the house? The house is the Iman. You have the foundation of this masjid. And you don't have windows. You don't have a nice chandelier, and you don't have lights, and you don't have beautiful carpets, and you don't have everything. You only have the foundation. Well, would you call that a house? I'm just going based on the hadith, based on this very same hadith. The pillars are there to keep up the iman. And the iman is the faith that is strengthened by the Quran. That Allah says, do this and don't do that. Don't do this, do that. That's where we get complicated. And then, we bring Salah, but most of the Quran we don't follow. Like last night I was mentioning at one place, what's the place we were at last night? Rehab Center? I will mention, <laughs> this is, don't take it serious, it's a little joke, but it can be real. <laughs> we pray Salah five times or 50 times a day. You know, we were taught in Miraj, the lesson of Miraj, that we were, the Prophet was given the first command of praying Salah 50 times when we went up, and got it reduced to five. Some of us probably pray 55 times a day. But you know what? When it comes to marriage, we forget about the Quran and Sunnah. We marry to suit ourselves, not for the pleasure of Allah. Not in the line of the Sunnah. Then we are like, hey boy, this lady is too old for me. Cancel that proposal. Couple months here. Yeah. Couple years. And we forget the Sunnah. Of 15 years old, I was going to be Jeremy We forget Sunnah and Quran, you know. Huh? That Qul in kuntu tuhibbun Allah, fattabiyuni. What Allah says? Qul in kuntu tuhibbun Allah, fattabiyuni. Surah Ali Muranja, chapter 3, verse 31. If you love Allah, 
follow the Rasul. Suddenly we say, we ain't following the Rasul. We follow him. Malay, ma uh, wait, this is Malay, right? Is it? We follow Malay tradition. We follow Pakistani tradition. We follow Bangladeshi tradition. We follow Arab tradition. We follow our traditions. We don't follow Sunnah anymore. But the reunion, as like I said, if you love Allah, follow the Rasul. But when it comes to our nafs, we put aside Quran and Sunnah and they're following the Rasul. You see the point? I mean, I don't have a problem when a person say, well, I don't like the lady. There's much me. It's not compatible. L listen to this difference here. We have the choice that if you marry someone, you marry someone, you marry someone that you like. I mean, there are, there, you have many examples of many sisters made proposal to the Prophet Sallallahu and he refused it. He offered other Sahabas, go ahead, mashallah. And there were many proposals that were made to him, and he accepted. So you have the choice. Yeah, you have the choice of saying, well, there is no kufu, there is no compatibility. Uh, I don't think I can live with this person. You have that choice, that's a choice. We have the choice of eating biryani, bread, lamb, beef, but we cannot condemn what we don't like. See your point? Isn't that a hadith? If you can't eat something, don't eat it. But don't let us eat the food. You can't get married to a certain person. But you, we, are, we are not supposed to know, bring that law about and make it almost in practice that you don't marry people older than you. Where did that practice come from? Not from the Sunnah. We have seen in the Sunnah of the Prophet that he married people under his age, almost his age, and over his age. But when it comes to personal life and our daughters and sons' life, is how we want it, not how the Sunnah taught us. Right? And the Quran tells us to follow the Sunnah. Follow the Prophet. Whatever he did had great wisdom. Great barakat that will benefit us. But sometimes our rewards and our culture blinds us when it comes to Quran and Sunnah. But we read in it 40 times in the month of Ramadan. We boast of how many khatam we have made. How many times we completed Bukhari. But we miss the point of the Sunnah in Bukhari. The Sunnah in the life of the Prophet. The message in the Quran. I'm only using some examples. To remind myself, remind you, don't let these things happen. We are varif, we are weak. We can't do something, mashallah. We pray for Allah to guide us so we can do the right thing. And Allah forgive us if we didn't. But we don't let our nafs go beyond the Quran and Sunnah. We have to be careful for what we say. And I just wanted to use marriage as an example because I see that as a major problem in the world today. One of the most, one of the worst, one of the most dangerous things that is happening in the Muslim Ummah and in insan and humanity is the misconception of marriage the wrong intention of marriage and the whole nine yards around marriage. Those who don't want to marry, those who don't believe to get married, those who marry the wrong people, those who marry the right people and live the wrong life, a lot of complications. And then the production from that becomes fitna. A very serious problem, a very serious problem. That's why the Prophet says the best amongst you is, the, who is he who is best to his family. And he said, I am best because I'm best to my family. He taught us the lifestyle with a family. How to live husband, wife, parents, children. But when it comes to that, it's not the Quran and Sunnah way. It's my way. Our way. That's not 
not realizing that's the whole door of the house. Can you imagine that? You can have the most beautiful house. And I see you guys got some fantastic houses here. Beautiful, man. Wonderful. Beautiful. But if your family life is not happy, there is no happiness in that house. There is no sakina. It doesn't become a home. It becomes a house of bricks and walls. Bricks and walls. If you are multi-billionaire and you have a billion dollar business and you have a top Mercedes and BMW but you don't have the right husband and you don't have the right wife you're not going to be happy at home. Think about it. Think about it. Don't be happy. See how deep that is in Islam? That's why the Prophet ﷺ was very, very concerned of marriage. He had so many hadith, so many sayings about marriage. And that's a whole different topic. I'm not talking about, I suppose, to talk about the Quran. But it comes from the Quran. If you love Allah, then follow the Rasul. And that's why Allah designed in the Rasul's life. Because he was the messenger. And his lifestyle was a message. His lifestyle was the example that we are supposed to follow. Uswatun Hasana, as we were saying today in the khutbah, his pattern, his conduct, his lifestyle. He came to live the Quran. When Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and I was asked, tell us something about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Tell us about the Rasul. She said, he lived the Quran. So we recite the Quran. We teach the people to read the Quran. But living the Quran is very problem. Yeah, we pray Salah, we fight, we, do, we have the pillars. But what about all the laws? I only touch you one law. What about all the other laws? The Quran tells us about it. I don't want to get in details about it. Uh, uh, marriage is something that I, I remind myself as an example from the Quran and the Sunnah because it is something most of us will be involved in. But the Quran teaches us about inheritance. Huh? How many of us, when it comes to inheritance, we show our property according to the Quran? How many parents share their wealth according to the Quran? But we pray in Salah. Yeah. We give in Zakat, basic, fasting, Hajj. We're very wealthy, we're very educated. Listen, it's 45 years now, Alhamdulillah, I've been in this town, mashallah, all over the world, Holland, London, all over, you name it. That's a problem. Marriage life. The Quran tells us about that. The inheritance. How many of us really show property well? You know, people who don't have properties, but they share whatever they have because it's little. But those who have plenty of properties, then they die. And what happens? Brothers are fighting brothers. Sisters are fighting sisters. They become the worst enemies. Because we read the Quran. We taught people to read it, but we don't live by it. Do you guys have that problem here? I don't know. I'm just saying, I'm telling you what happens in the world. I do you have that problem here, I'm sure. Okay, I, I, I didn't want to say anything that is not real. That's a humanity problem. Yes, non Muslims face this problem also. But that's why we are Muslims. That's why we Muslims are chosen people. For, for the entire humanity. So that we can live by the Quran and Sunnah and be the example for the non-Muslims. But we are not even examples for ourselves. Our children we are not good examples to. <laughs> when it comes to sharing the wealth, we become very selfish. Is which child we like more, that's who we give more. 
And sometimes, you know what, it's very unfortunate. The child that is the, and I don't, don't miss me, my point by using examples now. The child that is a doctor and a lawyer and the accountant and is making plenty of money, that's the one you give more money to. Because you like that one more. It's all about nafs. It's not about Quran and Sunnah anymore. Astaghfirullah. You know how many problems show Imams, do you guys face these problems? Questions? But I get goosebumps when I talk about this because it hurts. You know, when I, brothers come and say, Shaykh, my brother is there five times a day in Masjid praying Salah, but he robbed me. Could you talk to him? I'm like, oh Allah, don't give me this difficult task. They all push him back. I can't handle that. I say, you can't handle your brother, you want me to handle your brother? What are you telling me? Ask that brother. You know how many families this happened to? All over the world, all over the world, India, Pakistan, I have people from Pakistan call me and say, Sheikh, oh, Wallahi, I'm in a masjid, now walking out, the family stopped me, the fires, this, that. So what is the problem? I say, Sheikh, our mom died in Pakistan. And my wife's brother. Two brothers, they took all the property and didn't give the wife, the sister, anything. Like, oh, Allah. All of the whole idea is. But listen, we're reading the Quran, you know. <laughs> we're teaching the Quran. Thousands of students we meet are Ufas. Yeah? Yeah. But we're not living by the Quran. Yeah, we pray in Salah. You see, the point I'm trying to get at my brothers and sisters, Salah, Zakah, Fasted, and Hajj are pillars of Islam to keep this all straight. This is the Hadith. That is not my opinion. That is not my opinion. You've got all these scholars here. That is not my opinion. That's what Prophet Sallallahu says. Sometimes, you know, we wonder if people are not praying Salah. We pray Salah. Are we not marrying according to Quran and Sunnah? We're not sharing the wealth that Allah blessed us with huh? according to Quran and Sunnah. If we were not praying Salah, what would we have done? As for as we were saying in the khutbah today, we would have been the worst of the worst. Alhamdulillah, we still on survival. Head above water, mashallah. But we are not supposed to live head above water. We are supposed to live entirely above water. Muslims are supposed to be on a different level. Why do you think we are the best ummah? Why? The last Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the greatest ummah, the largest number. Christians nowadays, are the largest in numbers. But you might ask a Christian, say your name is Harry. Do you go to church? He says no. So he only says he's Christian. He doesn't even practice Christianity. But when it comes to practicing a religion, generally, Muslims have even outnumbered Christians. Christianity, you know, that is their statistics. I'm not giving you my statistics. They have said that themselves. Remember, the Maulana just told you I've been a former president of. Uh, you listen, I had rabbis as my secretaries, pastors and priests as my secretaries. Alhamdulillah, mashallah, my secretaries, because I was a president. I'm now the co chair of another of the city interfaith council in South Florida there. Alhamdulillah, appointed by the mayor of the city. So, yes, yes. We have other people in the world, but we, the Muslims, they have these problems in their communities. Nobody says no. Don't miss that point also. But we Muslims were chosen to set the example. Our Prophet was sent as the best example to the world. Rahmatullahalameen. But Allah says in Surah 
uh, chapter 34, verse 28, chapter 34, verse 28, Allah is saying, We did not send thee Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa except as a universal messenger, meaning his message is for the entire humanity. And what was his message? The Quran. His example, his lifestyle is for the entire humanity. So we who are the followers of the Prophet وسلم, we have to continue that example for humanity. For the pleasure of Allah, of course. But are we doing that? See my brothers and sisters, how serious this issue is. I'm only touching basic little issues and not high-tech issues. And for your scholars here, high-tech voltage issue. Basic. Home of here, as you call this. Domestic chores. We are supposed to be. The entire world. Illa kafatil al nas, bashira wa nabira, walakin akfal al nas ila ya'lamun. What is Allah telling us? That this message of the Quran, this lifestyle of the Prophet should is for the entire humanity. Walakin akfal al nas ila ya'lamun. Allah is saying, but most of people don't know, understand that. They don't know that. But not only the non Muslims don't know that. You and I don't know that too. Because we Muslims don't live like that. Generally speaking, illa mashallah. It's a basic problem. Listen, you know how many people cry tears? I mean children, grandchildren, adults. So sad when they cry. And I, I recently I had to give up a family an advice and I said, you know, this brother got all the wealth of his parents. And the rest of brothers and sisters has got a little time in compared to the millions. I'm talking about a billionaire family. A billionaire family came to me and spoke to me about this issue. And they're like, one of the brothers alone got everything. We just got a house, we got a piece of land, but the billions? And their children now doesn't have anything. So I, I, I'm like, you guys need to go talk to your brother. Say if your parents made a mistake by not sharing the wealth equally and properly, you guys need to tell him. If he's praying Salah and he's performing Hajj, he's also going for Umrah every year, you know. Oh yeah, <laughs> every year. Because he's a millionaire. <laughs> well, you are, tell him that if his parents didn't know better, make dua that Allah forgives them. But you do the correct thing now. And you share the wealth properly. So they will be forgiven. And you will then have to carry the burden and task for knowing what is right from the Quran and you're not doing it. You see the point? You can't say, well, my father did it. So I'm going to continue doing it. That is contrary to the teachings of Islam. When the Prophet used to give the message of La ilaha illallah, what did the Kufari say? That's contrary to our fathers. That's contrary to our forefathers. The Prophet says some to them, you don't worry about that, you do what is right. If we have to go according to forefathers and what they did, if it was wrong, that's a problem. What Allah tells us in the Quran, if your parents, uh, where is that, Surah Luqman, eh? Surah Luqman. If your parents uh, ask you to do shirk, do not follow, follow them. Do not obey them in shirk. Olakin was sahih kuma for dunya. Be nice to them. Be loving to them. Be kind to them. Be caring with them. But if they ask you to break the laws of the Quran, don't obey them in that. Allah is telling us that. Don't obey them. Love them. Be nice to them. Care for them. They did the wrong thing by giving one child more, which was injustice. You don't follow that. Your parents made a mistake. You correct it now as the big son or the big daughter. See the problem? And then now you have problems. The brothers not speaking. The children, children become enemies. And the poor imams and scholars have to be passing fatwa. Questions, answers. And if the imams take this side, the whole family don't like you. 
So more corruption and fitna. Fitna ala fitna. See how bad it is. But if you correct this problem from the root, no problem. See how simple? The Quran. If we follow this Quran, we wouldn't have all this fitna. That's what I was saying a little while ago, Ibn Allah, remind myself of you. If we take the line of the Quran, less disunity and division and corruption. Because by obeying the laws of the Quran, we receive the rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By obeying the laws of the Quran. But again, a lot of us only think that the laws of the Quran are just basically the pillars. The pillars were designed to keep the house up, the house of Iman. But when it comes to marriage, that sometimes when it comes to halal, we forget Quran and Sunnah when it comes to eating halal too, because it's all about the stomach. You know, there's a famous saying, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. So when it comes to the stomach, we forget Quran and Sunnah also. So we even eat halal. I mean, don't eat halal. Quran again, eat halal. Allah will tell you about eat what is good, eat what is halal. Some of us eat what is halal, but not take you back what is good. So we bring salah, but we not obey the Quran. Halal and take you back. Interesting. Good, good. Didn't, didn't the Quran tell us about what to eat? Huh? So the Quran tells us all the time, Eidul Adha, we learn the story of the lamb. That time. He just went through Eid al-Adha, right, in July. That Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam was given a lamb. Subhanallah. When he passed the test, that he attempted to do what Allah said, to slaughter his son Ismail alayhi salatu wa salam. He fulfilled the command. As he was about to, Allah and the angel with the lamb, the round sheep, what was it? Was it a uh, was it a chicken? <laughs> what was it? A ram sheep. Okay, just remember what we're talking about. Heading to a little point here now. Link to the Quran again. What a beautiful lesson and example that Allah has taught us in the Quran for all generations to follow. We celebrate the, 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 that whole mission and lesson. Eidul Adha, Qurbani, sacrifice. When the Prophet Sallallahu got married, right? He did a walima. What did he do for the walima? Did he slaughter chicken or lamb? Lamb. Everybody know that, eh? Yeah. But when he did um, Akika, you have children. A boy, Two, two, two lamb, two sheep, a girl one, exactly. We could go on and on and on with them. So what we saw in the lives of the Prophet or the Prophets and the Prophet was the love to eat lamb. But we love chicken more than lamb. How do you like that? And then we say we are sunnah to eat. <laughs> sunnah. Nobody says no. Chicken. I'm not telling you no chicken. Chicken, the birds, chicken is okay. It's halal. It's enjoyable. Allah provided it for us. Allah speaks about it. But we love that more than what the Rasul says Allah. Why don't you do it? Do, are we ordered to do chicken for Akita? Are we ordered? One man came to me in, in Florida and said, Sheikh, could I sacrifice 100 chicken for Quran? <laughs> My brother, listen. You would like to do that. But it's what the Rasul did, we got it. So we understand Akika is love. We understand Qurban is love. We understand the whole scenario. But when it comes to our nafs, it's what we love. But even more than that, it's what the doctor tells us. Versus what the Rasul loved and tells us. See? We forget the Quran and the Sunnah. Allah. Quran. I'm only speaking of things in a line that is in line of Quran that the professors have lived and exemplified. What about eating? 
The Quran tells us about honey. We only talk about that in the bayan. We clarify how nice honey is. Do we really eat honey all the time? Daily? Do we really eat black seed all the time? Do we really eat zaytun all the time? Olive oil? Fig? Do we? Because that's not the lifestyle of the dunya. It might be there as a delicacy and show business, but it's not what we love. And Allah tells us that, by, I'm not telling you what is in some tradition in Hadifa, and then one guy will come and say, Zarif, hey, weak, not strong. We're talking about what thing he was like to. We're talking about a honey that when the Prophet وسلم, went to one of his wives, and, um, they, and, and the wife gave him honey, and Aisha and, and, and well, Hafsa knew of it, and they told him, your mouth was smelling not too well, because they knew he went and had honey by another wife. So he, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was like, I will stop drinking honey. Allah said, you will stop drinking honey? You can't make hal haram for yourself, but I have made halal for you. See, simple as honey. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not have the authority to not drink honey. Or to say, I don't want honey. Allah says, you cannot make haram for yourself, but I have made halal for you. Is it not powerful? If the Rasul Allah recommended, what about you and I? What are we saying again? Well, we pray in Salah. We go for Hajj. We fast in Ramadan. We fight it over every day. Basic brothers and sisters, I'm just reminding myself of your basic things in the Quran. These are the things of that house of Iman. And if we love Allah, then our Iman will rise and become stronger when we are reminded of the verses of the Quran. Listen, these are just basic things I'm reminding myself of. Your wife, eat, drink, sleep. See? Basic. That we don't obey in the Quran. These are major issues. That's why, you know, we wonder that we pray Salah, we fasting, we go to Hajj, but we're not finding Sakina in our life. We're not finding peace in our life. We're not finding happiness in our life. Because we don't live by the Quran. We don't live by the Quran. So these are just a few examples. And listen, there's so many, many, many other things Allah tells us. Uh, I will mention about marriage a little while ago. You know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this world, this dunya, you already know that. I don't, I'm not going into those points. I'm only getting the point here, Muhammad Abdullah. So that's yeah. We all know that. We give bayans on that. But after creating the entire universe, then he created Adam al right? And he created him. And then he created who? Hawa al Eve. What was the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did when he created Adam and Eve? He got them married. Don't you know that? Everybody knows that, right? Do you know that is in the Bible? That is in the Torah? That is in the Psalms? And that is in the Quran? The first thing Allah did. Remember there is a lesson about that? That Allah put Prophet Adam to sleep. And then when he got up, he saw in front of him, Hawa alayhi salatu wasalam. He created Eve, Hawa. And Adam alayhi never saw a woman before. So he's like, what is this? He saw the garden of paradise. Apples and grapes and trees and everything else. But he never saw a woman. So he was like, what is this? And she answered him and said, I am a woman that Allah has created for your peace, for your happiness. Interesting, huh? For your happiness. Allah knows that you are lonely. And Allah created me as your companion. And Allah says in Surah Rum, this is not my idea. This is Quran. Allah says, I have created your spouse for you. So that you will find Sakina 
Exoda, Romans chapter 13, verse 21. So that you will find peace and comfort. And Allah says that I will show unto you muhabbat, love, and rahmah from Allah. Chapter 30, verse 21. So what was the first thing Allah did when he created Adam and Eve? He got them married. And he said, this is the peace and tranquility in your life. And when we grow up, marriage is the last thing we want to do. We want to get a degree first. We want to have a dunya first. We want to have all the world first. And then somebody comes to you and says, Brother Sahib, a brother comes to you and says, I see you have a nice daughter, 19, 20, 21 years. Subhanallah, I have a nice son too, 21, 23, 24. I heard your daughter is really nice. Pious, my son is half his own Quran too. He's Adam too. Whatever. The first thing the father asks, where are you working? Can't come to He didn't worry about you half his own Quran, you know. He's first. <laughs> then he said, you know what? I need to make my doctor, my daughter this, and teach her that, and graduate her that, and get all this for her. Here is the good opportunity coming. Refuses a pious boy, and it happens both ways. Refuses a pious girl in the right time for marriage. Yeah? Our oh, nafs again versus the Quran. This is not Hadith, this is Allah designed this time. Allah designed the coming together of man and woman. And he caught man and woman, Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 1. He brought man and woman together, and he caused from the coming together of man and woman, many men and many women. Allah is the one who brought man and woman together and created many men and many women. First thing he did. See? I mean, Alhamdulillah here, I do see eh? I see a lot of young people married here, but you know it's not happen very soon. They will put houses for this. Let my son have a BMW for this. Let my son have a nice house for this. Let my son have a good job for this. Uh, because that's what the daughter's fathers are looking for. See? And then what happens? We try to build a whole world first and then do the right marriage in the right time. But Allah did that. He built the marriage first. And say, you build the family and build the houses and things together. Now, I don't have a problem. I'm not saying that the boy must take the girl and put on the street. Huh? But sometimes the family has enough to help this wonderful couple and make things go as they build a life together. And they grow together. But it's just a concept. Now, nobody says no. You need to have the compatibility, the istidar, to get married. Remember, that's the law. But there are people who have it. But they just want to have a society status. High society status. So then they wait, they make the match, but they wait for when their financial society status so they could do a big wedding, spend a lot of money, waste a lot of money, extra for extravagance, and then it contradicts the hadith. That that wedding that has extravagance and, and, and um, israf doesn't have barakat. See the problem? But listen, I am not telling you anything new. Remember that? Don't go and say, She Jafar came and told us this and wait. I want to remind you on myself that when it comes to our nafs, our, our personal life, we put the Quran and Sunnah away and we do it how we want to do it. We do it how the society does it. You may not be facing that right now. Are you facing that? Oh, oh, well, look, I've seen some yes. You see, I was going to tell you, maybe you will face that in the next two generations. Because, see, we face this in America. Because Muslims are just a minority in America. So the majority of people are absorbed in the society. So the majority, majority, not everybody, they live this American lifestyle. You tell a young person about marriage, you're like, are they, why? what are you talking about? The mother and father said, oh, that's my bacha, bhai. But you know how old the bacha is? 21 years. I'm like, I stop for a lot. 
Then by the time you're ready to get them, all the bacha has gone. <laughs> by the time you're ready to get this boy and get married, and girl, they know more bacha. But you think they're still bacha. They're still children. But they're out in the university and the colleges, all the bacha gone. They're the biggest adults outside. They do. They do worse than <laughs> adults do. But in our eyes as parents, what are you telling us, Sheik? Get all the bacha married? You don't have bacha, hey, bye. <laughs> yeah. Let's start for a Contrary to Quran and Sunnah. See the problem? But we pray in Salah, we perform in Hajj, we fast in the whole of Ramadan. You're supposed to do that. Sometimes I'm worried. If we were not fasting and doing Hajj and praying Salah, what kind of lifestyle we would have been? Huh? At least the Salah and the Zakat and the fasting and the Hajj helps to keep our Iman a little bit. Huh? You see what I'm saying? Huh? But if we didn't have that in our life, that's why Allah has designed that as the pillars to at least keep that house up. You know, like how the people who don't have these pillars in their life, other religions, other way of life, that's why they live a any life. But basically we have that, so it keeps us there. But the only thing is that we go in our clock. We don't live in Allah's clock. We think we design our life. We think we got the clock. We will get married to the person that we want. We will get married in the time that we want. And then COVID, COVID comes and everybody will die. <laughs> Shouldn't we use COVID as an example? That you can't tell when we will die and who will die. Even doctors are struggling for their lives. Presidents of big countries are struggling for their lives. Huh? Just recently, President Biden got COVID. President Trump got COVID. Biggest national, democratic, international, powerful country like America. And they couldn't prevent themselves from getting COVID. With all the security around the White House, they got COVID. They could have set up some security system to make sure COVID does not get in the White House. <laughs> but what did Allah teach us? That Allah is in control. Allah is in control of all of us. You could be the president of the most powerful country in the world. President of England, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, he got it. Powerful, the British who rule the world. They could have designed some system to prevent their presidents from getting it. They make the laws. They go out of space. They go onto the moon. Think about it. They monitor the whole world. And they couldn't prevent their top, highest position from getting COVID. That was a lesson that Allah wanted to teach you and I. That if Allah wants to destroy or Allah wants to take some lives, or Allah wants to get something, kun fire kun be it will just happen. And you and I are still waiting to get married? Who didn't marry? I'm talking about those who didn't marry. And I'm talking about those who married and you're looking for an ex-wife. Those who not married. Because I'm not talking about the second wife thing because I get problems, and nobody will invite me back to South Africa. <laughs> so we don't, I didn't mean that, eh? man. Those who single. You got the means, and you got the health, and you got the thing. You know, I know people that they live in their homes, huh? their parents got five bedroom homes. But they still don't want their sons to get married. They want to make sure they own a palace outside and they got big things outside so society will see my son has everything and he got married. <coughs> see, this is my problem. Well, I'm only connecting this to Quran. What Allah did first for man and woman. We do it on our clock against the Quran. Royal Bengal Trading, importer, exporter, wholesaler of Bangladeshi Indo Pak groceries and spices. We specialize in various authentic Indian masalas, juices, flowers, rices, and spices. We offer exclusive brands as Ocean Pearl, Shan, National, Tilda, Himani, and many, many more. We're located at 36B Coroni Savannah Road, Charlieville, Shiguanas, Trinidad, and Tobago. You can call us at 473-4676 or call 476-3117.
email us at wahabdk at gmail.com.